everyone, and welcome back to another Past Podcast. I am Case Aiken, and as always, I am joined by my co-host, Sam Alisea. Hi! And today, this is a bonus episode where we are taking another pass at another pass. So in this case, we are talking about the sixth episode of the show. We are talking about Spider-Man 3. Yes, we are talking about Spider-Man 3. Indeed. Yeah. 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 Um, I will say this. The episode that we're going to listen to, right? Because we always we always kind of like talk and we talk about prepare people for what they're about to hear. The sound quality is good. So yeah. that's really nice. Um, and also we have our lovely Jeff and Jeff is amazing. And so it's always going to be a conversation. Um, I do think that this episode gets closer to our current modern format, but it's still more of a progress kind of like spitballing and kind of agreeing that you liked what you said but not quite having a thesis at the end but i think it's getting closer to what another pass has become yeah and and this one was an interesting one because um we we realized that the production schedule had caused the the two part or like the two the double feature of the amazing spider-man movies uh to come out a little premature for when spider-man uh homecoming was coming out Mm-hmm. And it seemed like, hey, we should probably, you know, put put do, put do that out there. The, <laughs> yeah, we should probably do a Spider Man. Um, <laughs> so this one was kind of a scramble. We we weren't thinking that we were going to do this movie particularly early on, and then it was like, yeah, you know what? Let, let, let's take a swing at it. Jeff, you free? Je- All right, Jeff's free. Cool. We'll, we'll get that episode in. Um, which is why actually the next episode is also going to be a Jeff episode. When at the time I was trying not to have it be like the same guest every episode. If that makes right. any sense. No, no, that definitely means variety is the spice of life. <laughs> because the next episode, we were talking about the Planet of the, of the Apes movie, the Tim Burton one, because that was when War for the Planet of the Apes came out, which this is really giving me nostalgia feels for like the early days of certain POV where we were seeing all these movies for the show. We were talking, of, you know, it was, there was a lot of like nerd conversations going on uh, and it felt very exciting. Um, and this is also around the time where uh, Fun and Games with Matt and Jeff is just getting off the ground. So I forget if he plugs it in this episode, but it's coming out around this time. um, And very shortly after this would actually come onto the banner for certain POV and actually make this like a network and not just a show that has some spinoffs. So fun times. Um, Yeah. Before we start this episode, if you haven't heard it before, I am actually fairly positive about Spider-Man 3. Yeah, you are. Which I think will surprise some people generally just because the movie has such a bad reputation. Uh, but I actually rather like it. I, I came out of the theaters loving it. There's a, there, there are some messy things in there. Uh, but I think it's actually like overall a good movie, which is why I didn't want to really do this early on because I, I like it. I don't think it really needs that much of a change. It's also why I don't have like really strong sentiments about what things to change. When you get into it, although we do certainly have things that we discuss where like this would have been nice to fix. Yeah, I definitely differ from you. I did not enjoy this as much when I left the theater and actually had not watched it since I had seen it in that theater because of the feelings I had when I left the theater. And I think just generally, um, I think that the movie is very messy. I don't think that the performances are bad. And I actually think that some of the ideas are quite good. And I, while I was listening to it, I was like, oh, wow, you know, actually Case is making some good points of positivity here that, that I agree with. And, and I genuinely like where you and Jeff go um, with, with, with the general pitch. Um, but I definitely will say that, um, since I could not remember a lot of this movie and I did rewatch it. Yeah, no, it's still, it's still a hot mess. It is a hot mess movie that needs to be tightened up and edited a lot in my opinion. (laughs) Yeah. So why don't we have everyone listen to the episode again? The audio quality is pretty good. I had figured out how to record myself pretty well at this point and edit my own levels pretty well. And Jeff has a really good setup because he's a voice actor professionally. So uh, our our stuff sounds pretty good. Um, yeah, this and, episode sounds great. Yeah. Uh, behind the scenes, I am still having some issues with the way I do my recordings where it uh I was having file corruption issues if it went too long. So uh, but so I would like do like 15 minutes and then break and then 15 minutes and then break. Um, but it doesn't sound as like egregious as it did for the Star Trek, the motion picture episode. Um, we're a lot better at like picking up our threads and having it be like kind of controlled. So 
It doesn't sound too bad. It's 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 a pretty good episode, I think. Yeah, agreed. Cool. Well, so here is that episode. And uh, when we come back, we will talk about our thoughts on it. And we'll probably have a plug somewhere somewhere in there for one of the, the many great shows on our network. Um, but uh, and, and until then, here, here here's the episode. Spider-Man 3. Get me pictures of Spider-Man. Yeah. Welcome to Certain Point of View's Another Pass podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Just go to certainpov.com. Thanks, folks, for tuning in to Another Pass podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and today I'm talking about Spider-Man 3, and I'm joined for this conversation with none other than Jeff Moonen. Hey there, everybody. It's great to be back. Jeff, uh, thanks for coming back on. Excited to talk about this one, especially because Spider-Man: Homecoming is coming up soon. So we we really wanted to like talk about like all the Spider-Man mishaps that have happened before. We already did Amazing Spider-Man one and two, and now we're talking about the one that like was pretty badly panned at its time and kind of killed the original franchise. Kind of the Batman and Robin of Spider-Man. Yeah, yeah, pr- pretty much. I'd like to talk about that a little bit because Spider-Man has definitely been a very interesting sort of character in a cin- in the modern cinematic universe because uh, they've tried to reboot Fantastic Four a few times and they've it's just been a non-starter the entire time. X-Men, they've had to kind of keep re-upping the license but have more or less kept their own internal thing going on. Spider-Man has gone through several, like, is somewhere in between. And the Raimi uh, franchise, I suppose, was the first big success, which meant they kind of had to keep some things. And it's all been a lot of uh, plug ups and wood glue and halfways. So it's and I guess I'm thinking about this in terms of um, because I think uh, X-Men came out in 2000, correct? Or some uh, right around there. Thereabouts. I would say that that was that's kind of like the I know stuff came out before it. I know Blade was before, but like 2000 X-Men. That was kind of the beginning of sort of this era that I'm thinking about. Stuff that came before is definitely all very important, but sort of like the modern landscape of comic book adaptation superhero films has been in the 2000s. And so I guess 2002 yeah. when the first well, Spider-Man. Well, this is the generation that leads up to uh, Iron Man 1 coming out and kind of shifting the paradigm again. Exactly. Uh, although in that case, like really ramping it up. And we thought like that this era that we're talking about <laughs> was already ramped yeah, up. Yeah, all the leaps, missteps, move forwards, move back. Some were bigger than we thought, some were smaller than we thought, and they all got us to where we are now. And so none yeah. of them should be discounted. And I think that's why it's a great idea for us to discuss this movie because, you know, it came out, what, 2007, I want to say? And yeah, it's so it's been 10 years. And people had very strong feelings about Spider-Man 3 coming off of well, Spider-Man 2, which was at that point the most successful, the most critically acclaimed, the most beloved, in a way, uh, comic book franchise, comic book adaptation. Absolutely. To that moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, regardless of uh, opinions in retrospect about that movie, and I, I, it's generally positive. There are one or two people who are not fans of it, and I, I get mad at them because they're stupid. <laughs> But it, it was certainly the most financially successful. It broke the record for opening weekend that the previous Spider-Man had set just two years earlier. True. Uh, yeah. Uh, there was a lot of hype going into this movie. It, it felt like it's like, all right, cool. We're, we're getting the next one. Like, they can't not bat it out of the park. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a lot. of. When I saw it, I was like, oh, yeah, everyone's going to love this movie because I actually really like this Spider-Man movie. Uh, I know why people don't like it. I I can see all that, but like, I there there's a couple scenes in here that are good enough that they make me favorable to the movie, regardless of obvious flaws. And I'm always surprised at how much people don't like it and can't even remember the moments that I'm like, no, don't you see? This was so good. No, there was some wonderful. Uh, there's a for all of its. I got to be fair for here for all of its hokiness, for all of its slapstick. There was some great character subtlety, and all this is very fresh in my mind and very new because I feel I should point out before we go any further. Um, I watched Spider-Man 3 for the very first time this week to record this episode. Um, and I appreciate that. I, I do this for you. I, I... All right, so let's talk about 
what we liked, then what we didn't, and then what our pitches are for this one. Because I, I, I have a couple ideas, but I'm also in danger of running into other ideas I've had for Spider-Man movies before, because we did Amazing 1 and 2. All right. uh, and I think it has some shared problems, particularly with 2. I feel like Amazing Spider-Man 1 was actively trying to be different than this movie, and then Amazing Spider-Man 2 kind of went back in this direction. All right. Uh, and I would say it went worse. Um, so let's talk, yeah, so let's talk about good things. Uh, my favorite moment in this movie, and one of my favorite in all the Spider-Man franchise, is the creation of Sandman. All right. Uh, I thought it was great, and I have a hard time ha saying, like, well, they shouldn't do Sandman, because they had such a great scene when he, like, f like starts to come alive as this, like, sand elemental um, and it, it like is struggling to understand where he is and he sees the locket and he tries to pick it up and he can't and it like falls through his sandy hand um, and it's like the focus to like on that locket and that like connection with his daughter is the thing that's like driving him forward and it's like he could have died in this moment but will itself is why he continued to live like it's not even like the superpower stuff like this is the kind of thing that like myths are born on it's like like a man was like Odysseus was separated from his daughter and he was sent to hell but he fought his way back and in the very dirt where his body had decayed he like like formed the will to drive forward so that he could go back to his wife and you know like live the lordship that he was denied by Troy absolutely like it it's like that like he just like the hand forges around it and from that like his body grows out like it, it's such a great moment there. And, like, when I saw that, I was like, this movie is a great movie. Like, that was the moment where I was like, I, I don't think you're going to make me disagree with, like, problems. But I, I do think that I'm going to stand by this movie is a great movie. This film is not irredeemable. Just look at this moment. The, those several minutes. I agree. When I first saw them happen, it almost in my brain went to, you know, you could cut this little part out and it would almost look like an art film, like a stop motion art film. You know, you expect yeah. there to be like a very Norwegian uh, director's name at the end of it and it to have like, I don't know, um, to be very yeah, art no, house. Like, just like I said, like it like it, it becomes like myth at that point instead of like true, like true sci fi. It, it like transcends that level. Yeah, absolutely. I feel uh, which is that level that like like comic book stuff kind of goes back and forth. Like hence, like you got Thor and Iron Man in the same universe. So there's a little bit of sci fi in Thor and a little bit of uh like mythology and Iron Man, and they both have a balance point there. And that's like comic books, like super science. And to be fair, um, while my major, I think just about every gripe I have, or 80% of my gripes about this movie, can fall under the heading of too many villains, I feel all of them get really beautifully shot, intriguing, uh, either beginning moments or formative moments in some way that I almost feel as though, but we can't get rid of that. But we can't get rid of that, but right. you have to. It's hard. Like, and we can go more into that later because I have thoughts about like a similar thought, Like, but I don't know where I'd cut one. Um, all right, so that that, that's said. all good. I I think the, the dynamic of like, all right, so we're going to introduce Gwen Stacy as being like a fantasy for Spider-Man whenever life is getting too real. Mm -hmm. Like, he's so happy, but, like, here's an alternative where he gets to be back on the chase. Like, the the glory days of Spider-Man when he's really in the nadir. Yeah. Uh, so I thought she worked fairly well. I really liked Eddie Brock, like, uh, Topher Grace's Eddie Brock. I thought it was inspired casting to have him be, like, an anti-Peter Parker type Spider-Man. I agree. As opposed to being, like, uh, like he was kind of like a muscle band jockey kind of dude. Uh, he was a bro. Like he, he was just like, like guys, I'm a bro. It's cool. I'm gonna take these pictures. Oh, I, I couldn't get it. I faked it. Whatever. Um, yeah. Like that's Eddie Brock, and this is a much more interesting character, at least at first introduction. Like they, you could develop the character more, but in a movie with three villains, you're not gonna get that. Time. Agreed. And I was really, and I went into watching this with that like everybody had said terrible things about Venom, about Topher Grace, about Eddie Brock. I really enjoyed his performance. I really enjoyed Eddie Brock, and I agree. He's and in a very interesting way, because they don't make him jockey, but they make him an the other kind of entitled nerd. Because in a way, Peter is the entitled nerd. And yeah. he's just, and Eddie is more of the assertive, <clears throat> aggressive entitled nerd. And yeah. if he doesn't get what he wants, he'll just outsmart people by making this happen. And come on, I, I, I this, you know, cut me a break. No, but you're right. There, there's, um, there, there, there can much to be said for simplifying aspects and that was one of the the pitfalls i think of the raimi trilogy because it was before uh we'd all kind of come to the like 
general consensus of you don't have to necessarily go with the character that's most popular. It's okay to do away with certain elements so long as you tell a good story. Right. I mean, this was the most uh, true to the comics uh, movie adaptation at that point. Yes. Uh, and it still holds actually being very true in a way that like even some of the Marvel movies don't really do it. Like they, they're true to the spirit, but they have like a lot of details kind of shifted. Agreed. Um, so it's it's impressive to see how much they accomplished considering that they were being like directly opposite like X-Men or Blade where they have like the thinnest kind of component of this, the, the source material. It's very material. tenuous. Uh, yeah. And then and just like build up from there it, as a generic superhero movie. Yeah. Uh, whereas this one kind of comes from the, an opposite direction. And I feel like Marvel, especially Phase 1, is kind of the happy medium. No, you're right. And then from there, they, they built and, dra- and branched out in Phase 2 and onwards. But you're right. And so this is an excellent case study as well in terms of you can get all the details right, but it doesn't mean you've made a great movie. Maybe good. Maybe not. All right. So let's move on to some of the stuff that we weren't quite as big a fan of. Uh, we've, we've mentioned the three villains thing. I think we've got a lot to talk about with that one. Agreed. It's uh, it's the problem a lot of superhero movies face. It's very similar to Amazing Spider-Man 2, which is why some of my f- the fixes I have are going to be related to that. But it's like Batman and Robin. We just saw that not too many years before where it's like, let's have villains everywhere. Yeah. Well, we got this person attached and we need to push this one. And well, what about this? And it's it's a bit of like... A little too much success makes too many ideas, makes too many cooks. You know, any of, take your pick yeah. on that. I mean, I will say I like things about all of them in this one, and sometimes not so much. Like they're they're actually three competing forces that are not connected to each other, which is actually really Im- impressive that they do. Like it's not like henchmen, uh, but I think I probably would simplify it to have like if I was going to do all three, mm-hmm. uh, to have one be sort of more of a, a mastermind. Yeah, absolutely, and I think the the. The big thing is they don't connect at all on the surface, but thematically they all connect beautifully. But unfortunately, you can't tie that up as well because on the surface they don't mesh and having them in scenes together is very awkward. Like even during the team up, it was awkward. There wasn't actually any team up. It was just kind of a double booking at the showdown. I have this like love hate relationship. Like when I every time when I first watch it, I don't care for this detail, but then on later viewings, I actually really enjoy it. With the way Sam Raimi makes some of the characters look like uh, cardboard cutouts of the comic book characters, uh, like J.K. Simmons, and in this case with um, uh, Gwen Stacy. Okay. Like I don't. Know, it, the first time I watched it, I actually was like not a fan. And then in repeat viewings, I'm like, oh, I actually no, I, I dig it. I see what you're doing. Like it's it's cool. Like it was like a little too much on first viewing because I was like looking for like realism. Uh, and then when I like go back and look at it as like a this like weird cartoon that Rami has put together with live actors, um, it's uh, a different feel. And I'm like, oh, I'm actually much more okay with this whole design. Yeah, you have to have some sort of surrealism that goes on when you make a movie with superpowers just by its very nature, yep. I believe. So so what then follows is you need to have a certain either internal consistency or the distinct or some distinct rules so that when you break them, you break them well. Um, I feel the, the Raimi trilogy has a very muted resting pattern. Um, Peter is very soft-spoken. Um, MJ is much more sober and muted than she is ever is in the comic books oh yeah oh yeah and then you've got i want pictures of spider-man right now and i'm gonna chomp on this cigar and i'm just gonna be the best damn jameson you know and like i'll make him infamous (laughs) yeah jk simmons like nailed it from moment one um for for being like a like an actual living breathing comic book character yeah and whether that's that's an acting directing producing whoever made what awesome choices bravo brava here here um, because again, it was rules broken. And even in, in the first Spider-Man film, when you have Peter, they're just like, well, um, he's actually a hero. No, he's not. I'm going to push him like, and it's just perfect. You had mm-hmm. rules, you broke them. There we go. That's great. And yeah, it's almost like if you're going to do like vignettes of like Spider-Man and Jameson, uh, like not any of the rest of the characters, but like the character Spider-Man, who was a CGI character for the most part. Yeah. Uh, was interacting with, like, you would do the most surreal. Like, you wouldn't want it to look 
realistic because that would create the uncanny valley even more so with like the CGI Spider-Man. Um, so if you were going to do like Jameson being harassed by Spider-Man and vice versa and like do those like famous scenes from like the Ditko run. Yeah. Like it would it, it, like you could do those as short films with this cat or with with Simmons basically and then CGI Spider-Man. Yeah. And it would work at, like you. <laughs> yeah. I feel like Simmons would have the best weekend. Yes. <laughs> And if you and if you wouldn't, I don't want to know. I just like how this feels in my head. Um, no, and you're right. There's, and so when you have such good, clear step away choices like that, it's when they get muddled that it, it gets more frustrating. And I suppose yeah. Gwen Stacy is a is a distinct choice as well, but one that I suppose doesn't read as much. Um, I think Gwen Stacy kind of comes across, certainly to me, as an idea of trying to. Uh, commit to comic book detail for the sake of comic book detail. I mean, they'd already wrapped several pieces of the Gwen Stacy mythos into Kirsten Dunst's Mary Jane. Yeah, I have thoughts about Mary Jane, but that's more of the franchise as a whole. Agreed. Um, And it's that kind of thing of they'd already... um, All right, I'm going to get real uh, graphic here. They've basically, like, pulled all the organs and pieces and bones out of Gwen Stacy's corpse here out of the form and body to build the modern Prometheus of Mary Jane Watson in these movies. And then they throw the shell up there to fill, fulfill the remaining details. And maybe I just already from the word go have am d- uh, uncomfortable with them doing this in the third movie. I know they had plans for a fourth, the fifth, the sixth, but it was already right. like, we're well into this. You're doing this now. You could have done. Yeah. You could have done this with Betty at the Bugle or anybody else or any amount. Oh my of- God! Yeah, I, that's actually a note I have. Yeah, there, uh, not just because I. I <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the, a- absolutely, like, uh, the relationship that he had with with MJ was really more the Gwen Stacy relationship, um, in a like just as a whole. Like, yeah, sure. Uh, Mary Jane was technically the girl next door to Peter Parker, Mm -hmm. but like Gwen Stacy was the girl next door type. Uh, And they, for the most part have MJ as being that girl next door type. She just happens to be an actress. Uh, I never really like the thing is Kirsten Dunst. It like, like she's a very pretty girl. It like, and it's like, you know, all her life actress, but Mm -hmm. she doesn't look like a supermodel to me. She she's a beautiful girl next door type. She doesn't seem the sort that's like the impossible supermodel. Nor did they do her up like that. And they make a certain attempt to draw the intriguing parallels between MJ and Peter in the third movie. In the, you know, being in the public eye, dealing with your own insecurities, dealing with your critics. And again, there wasn't enough space to let that breathe. And it seems as though there was a definite they're both keeping things to themselves but why and bigger communication needs to happen you know the the real enemy is um although that's getting towards what my central thesis of what i feel the third movie should have been about what i think is a very um compelling uh statement thesis to work with on spider-man 3 because i will say they did a very i'd say they did a very admirable good job even of maintaining an interesting arc over the course of the trilogy. And I think, you know, the first one is um, discovering your identity, discovering your strength, your power, your your independence, and the terrors of that. And it's all flailing and crazy. And the second one is about finding that control and finding your footing. The third kind of should be um, letting go of your demons, letting go of your past and moving on. Because both MJ and Peter are established as having childhood demons one way or another. Whether it's Peter being bullied or MJ being terrorized by her father. And having specters of them never being the person that they already are. And either having reminders of that or having it uh, pushed into their face. And the fact that they're both dealing with that in parallel and on their own. When... They, they just kind of need to become adults. And they even have in the movie the fact, something that struck me is, you know, they're, they've been dating for a while and Peter's thinking of proposing to her. They don't live together. You live in right. New York City. New York City. Do you know how expensive rent is? 
Anything know, to crazy. save like, money. Live with yeah, someone. Yeah, you buddy in New York, you buddy up. <laughs> you buddy up. Yeah, and he's, and that that, means, he's in a one bedroom by himself. He, that yeah, that that is less. He lives in less than a studio. Oh man, he he could be the, like the third roommate in what should be a one bedroom apartment. Right. Like that is a very common thing in New York. Uh, that was my first apartment in New York, and so it, it was mine as well. There you go. <laughs> And so, and meanwhile, having that sort of dynamic would be funny. It'd be great for like a TV show kind of pace. Uh, it, it would be extraneous elements, but having Peter and MJ in a one bedroom together or a studio or sharing something isn't too out of the ordinary or too insane. And that's allows for and takes away from. And so, I don't know. Yeah. Um, Although, I mean, to, to be devil's advocate here, like we don't know exactly how long it's been between the second and the third movie. And like it could just be within their lease. It's true. Um, Although, I, like Peter doesn't look like he's he looks like he's paying month to month. But like it's very sure. possible that they both <laughs> actually have leases, which have been my situations in the past, too, where like it you just. All right, cool. In five months, we're moving in together. Cool. Right. All right, cool. <laughs> or like even the sense of, you know, one of them mostly living at the other one's place. Now, given how terrible Peter's living conditions are, maybe because he needs the balcony to jump off of his Spider-Man. I don't know. Um, like having most of his stuff at MJ's and he's just kind of getting by. There's Well, but he had like nothing at his place in Queens, right? Or like or wherever that his like studio was. Yeah. Like he could have a ton of stuff over at MJ's, which I don't think we really see. Um but his place could still look exactly the way it does right there. Like it's just the bare ne- or bare necessities right there. Yeah, I guess so. It's it's the bed, the uh, the Spider-Man outfits and the police scanner. It's all he needs. So that that's one of your ideas there. Now, do you have Another? Do you want to go deeper on this one, or, or do you have uh, the next point that you're thinking? I, I do want to go a little deeper on the, the central idea, because something that I had mentioned before, earlier in the episode, that all three of the main villains um, have some aspect of this thesis in mind. Whereas you have Harry as the wronged friend, or the, you know, the, the, the best friend from, from your past who isn't letting something go or isn't go, moving on or they need to work something out together. And even in the amnesia storyline gets a bit of a second chance and that allows a sort of uh, arrested development for uh, the actual concept, not the show, uh, for Peter to be like, hey, I don't, have to do, I don't have to deal with this anymore. I've got this back, but it comes back. It always does. You can't just tamp it down. It's another piece of great responsibility. Um, Flint Marco is a real element of, you know, moving on and letting go of his anger, letting go of, you know, it's um, Batman as an adult getting to let go of the death of his parents, which Batman is not allowed Mm -hmm. to do, but Peter might be. And he does do that. And that sense of making the hard choice and do you, um, do you get revenge or do you rise above it? And that conversation that he gets to have with Aunt May about it, while hilariously awkward and cringeworthy, is also a good look into that sort of, you know, what makes a hero style. And Eddie Brock is another piece of, like, an adult um, relationship of moving on, of pushing past, of making these things are because any one of the four of them, Peter, Harry, Eddie, Flint, um, has like kind of the power in their hands to walk away from their choices or to double down on them or to forgive or to rise above or to move on. And so removing any one of them, except Peter, he's Spider-Man, you need him. But removing any one of right. the other three, you... At least at this time, Sonny thought you needed him. Ah, uh, and to be fair, he was... Uh, whatever. Um... Any one of those other three, uh, any of the three antagonists, and you can still make intriguing uh, parallels that go on, something going on in Peter's life versus Spider-Man's life. And those are the big pieces, too, where it's kind of um, Mary Jane has herself and her career self, her, her, her actress self, which is the thing she keeps secret from Peter when she is replaced on the show on, and on the, right. in her run. And so it's kind of the the two faces, the two lives, and opening up about them and being able to, you know, you're not going to move on unless you let it go. And 
I actually feel like uh, something that struck me, and this is a little bit of a jump around, but I'm just thinking of it right now. Um, what I felt would have made for a really excellent um, things move on or things whatever for Peter and MJ at the end of this movie, rather than it being the jazz club. Although that is in its own like, okay, we're going back to where something horrible happened and we're making it okay. But in that same... Uh, we both know it was bad. It was, it was a bad moment. It's a bad moment. It's a bad moment. We're going to move on with our Let's lives. Let's move on with our lives. Is, yeah. Is it something the matter, Paul? Um, but it actually being... Uh, and I'll go back to the apartment thing. Like, uh, because, again, you don't really see either one of them, you know, Peter in MJ's apartment, certainly. But almost have kind of an end of the day thing where he comes home, whether it comes in through the window or something like that, which is a fun reference to the Times... Uh, in the comic books when he used to come in through the skylight of their of their loft and almost have a, hey, sweetie, how was your day? And actually talking about what happened to Spider-Man, what happened to Peter, what happened to MJ, what, you know, mm-hmm. almost have that sit on the couch, actually talk. Oh, so like this actually would wrap up the the theme of growing up from the first movie where it's like very much like this is puberty, by the way. White goo is going everywhere. Um, have this be like him coming into being like the full on adult, like maybe MJ's pregnant. Maybe you don't even necessarily have to have that. But like you don't have to have that. But like, where but it's it's, it's one of no those this, sort like, of something like, moving teenager. on. Like, yeah, this is the moment that he, okay, like we're not going to do a movie about him for a little while. We'll figure it out. But like he's an adult now. Like his story of like growing up has now concluded. Yeah. With the last, like with these three movies, yeah. like that story is what we told. You now. can have him still, you know, like still a grad student coming and talking about you know something he was talking about with Doctor Connors or whatever else. You know, it's just one of those the mundane identity version of and the adventure continues yeah which i i feel is important and honestly any of the other three guys if you still want to keep them in the movie you could have them be whatever peter is dealing with at the very beginning of the film and wrap it up like catch flint marco catch sandman whatever it is have them card off there's a reference for everybody and there's a moment of for people who aren't comic book audiences going why the hell is there a guy you can turn into sand and what's with the shirt and everything else? Don't worry about it. There's a more important story going on. Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of like um, extraneous subplots that uh, didn't need to happen in this movie that could have given the the big three big stories they wanted to yeah. do from space. But as a result, like it, it just feels so quick with like weird 180s when like stuff is introduced. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I know that they right, wanted well, to put Venom as a separate movie. But this is what happened. Right. Well, and also originally they wanted to do a Sandman Vulture team up. Yes, they did. Well, yeah. Uh, which w- would have been interesting. And I, I was uh, when I was rewatching it, I think the formula they're talking about in Professor Connor's class mm-hmm. uh, sounds like a, a formula that could apply to the Vulture's wings because they're supposed to be magnetic. Ah, and that might have been, like, left over from earlier. Or I realized that it could also be an application to Sandman, which would make sense for this movie. Either but way, fun Easter egg. Who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Because, like, if you're going to do a science scene, you'd try to make the science match what's being discussed in the, the movie itself. That's actually the classic scenarios of Spider-Man, like, where he was kind of like the Flash, where it's like, here's the science lesson for how I beat this villain. Like, with... Uh, uh, Vulture, it was like, I, I can figure out a magnet that will like allow his wings to no longer work. And with Sandman, I'm going to do something that causes sand to dissolve or sand to blow they apart. They don't let Peter be a scientist in these movies. They also don't let him quit. No. So may, maybe that's uh, that's something. Yeah, but also Toby McGuire as a quipper. I, I, I don't see it. <sighs> they could have at least tried. He could have tried. He could have tried. He's, he's, but he's bad when he does. Yeah. Like they have a couple throughout the the series, and they're, he's not he's not a quipper, but he's a good Peter. This is true. He's a, he is a great. Yeah, he's a very good he, Peter. He gets that nerd part of Peter down great, and that is not damning with faint praise. Right. Yeah. So I mean, like, here's my thought on on how to take this movie. Because like I said, I like this movie. I think that it is a, a, a jumble. But like, I was so happy when like Movie Bob did uh, is like, you are wrong about Spider-Man 3 video a few years back. Mm-hmm. And like, has since gone on and talked about like the franchise as a whole. Like that was such a good series. And I was like, I'm so, I'm so happy someone agrees with me because everyone just like say, says they hate it. But the, I will opinion. say that, oh yeah. Um, I, I will say though that the... The, the things with all of these characters could be better interlaced 
and considering that we have to like respect what the studio would want mm-hmm. uh, for the purpose of like this can't be like pie in the sky I'd remake it this way yeah um, so Venom's got to be there right you've been setting up the go- or uh, the new Goblin for two films now mm-hmm. Sandman doesn't and that sucks because Sandman's my favorite and it's, yeah, but, it's a great performance too and it's clearly what they were looking for and also is the best special effects because if you do uh, Venom and Green Goblin, you do another Goblin, which we already saw in a mm-hmm. movie, uh, and you do uh, Venom, who looks like Spider-Man but with, like, tentacles and is hard to light. So you can't do, like, really visually interesting sequences. At best, you can do, like, kind of abstract sequences. Yeah, and, and you like, can see that in how little they used him. Right. Uh, and Sandman ultimately is like a big visual spectacle, which is both something a studio would like for this type of movie, and Sam Raimi definitely wanted to do. So it's hard to say don't do that. Right, part. and you actually could have with a without a mastermind style thing going on. If you take Sandman out of the equation, both I mean uh, Harry in the third movie does a little bit of psychological warfare in a very in a way that I see Eddie Brock doing, and the two of them kind of yeah. being like, we need to ruin Peter's life. Yes, we do. And going at it, like two I could see ways. Harry not being the Goblin yet. But if they want, to, if they're like, well, we got to close his arc. It's hard to say that. Um, but you could have Harry just be like a, a continual background player. Yeah. Um, now, just like directly messing with him, or maybe like bankrolling uh, Eddie's and maybe selling or arms to maybe maybe not full on like villains everywhere, but like uh, high tech gangs. Like if he was selling goblin technology to just like random gangs, you know, like, like, so like bank robbery, but with super guns and like, like goblin bombs. Yeah. Uh, and like, he almost becomes like a Lex Luthor type. Yeah. That actually would be interesting. It, it would make but more then, sense like, again, than like the petulant kid on a glider. Right. I mean, if, like if Franco is definitely down for more movies, that's a great place to do it. If he's not, then it, you kind of have to do the goblin scene finally. Like you have to be like, well, we've been building it up for years. Let's let's get to it. Right. Um, in which case, you could be more. I'm thinking Hobgoblin uh, one, aka Ned Leeds, aka Roderick Kingsley is a fuck off. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> like the the Hobgoblin, like Mark one, was a manipulator and was great. Um, yeah, no, he was a great villain, just bar none. And I would say, like, if if Harry became that character, uh, and he, even if he wasn't actually actively, like, creating the other two, which I actually don't want him to do, but maybe it was, like, maybe, cre- well, maybe created the symbiote or maybe unleashed the symbiote. Like, he, like his researchers discovered this life form, and he's, like, trying to figure out what it does, and, like, he thinks he can weaponize it and uses it on Peter and it turns into the black. Yeah. That'd be, that'd actually be really interesting. Like it's still an alien, but it's also kind of a science thing, which makes it like ultimate venom with, uh, which was coming out about this time. That's true. Um, so you, you get that sort of like synergy there. Um, and it still works because it's just like, Oh, I thought this would kill him and like devour him, but actually it's empowered him, but it's empowered him with rage. And Peter, you're better than this. Like, how could I not see how good a, a person you actually yeah. are? And then you can still have a moment where he like sacrifices himself to, to stop the thing. The he's unleashed of his on father. Him. Right. No, it's all very, it's nicely cyclical and it's a better bringing in and less contrived than a meteor coming in the plot line. The director never asked for, you know, literally comes in out of space and attaches itself to uh, to his moped. You know, it just happens. Yeah, to... it, it, it's rough. It's a little. I mean, or they oh, fuck. They could have used John Jameson. They could have had him come back at the beginning, having like done an expedition and found this thing, and it was spirited away by the ma- the people who funded the space flight, which is Osborne Industries. Or it somehow ends up at the Daily Bugle because Sim- you know, because because uh, Jameson wants to to do something with it or see something about it or you know, Peter's taking pictures of it. And almost in a parallel to taking pictures of the spider and getting bitten by it, taking pictures of the symbiote and getting attached, you know. Actually, I'm really liking this idea of like, what if it was an an Osborne funded flight into space with John Jameson? And that's why the bugle is there at the event. Like they get they basically get a a scoop because the publisher's son was the one was the if you want to keep the alien origins at this like public event. And Harry knows Peter is Spider-Man at this point and hates uh, hates Peter, not just Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. So 
what like, was established in the movie before. So it's also an opportunity for Harry, now that he is aware of it, to try to just get it on Spider-Man without like facing him in public or anything like that. Like, yeah. To have Peter Parker be infected almost like the inverse of the the spider experiment. Yeah, true. Where he's like taking photos and like something gets him. And in this case, it turns like it bonds with him and is going to kill him. And it was an attempt to kill him instead of an accident that gave him superpowers. Yeah, it, it's it's a good parallel that doesn't that doesn't have to come off as very heavy handed. It. Yeah. Ooh, I'm I'm liking this one a lot more now that, that the more we talk Agreed. about it because then now we're basically doing like this dark twisted mirror version of the first Spider-Man movie, which I think they would like to do. Like this this would be a fun way to like do all of those things. Like uh, they already are twisting like the the, the Gwen Stacy ma- like doing the same kiss as Mary Jane moment. Yeah. And which I just felt in general they, was like okay, they're just letting people be dumb. So you got drama. Yeah, I like this idea we have. Um, yeah, so maybe Hobgoblin is is more of the manipulator that's, like, setting up everything and is waiting to come in at the end. Like, I think with a better suit, like, I don't get why they decided to make him look like Robot Ninja Surfboarder. Like, the, it was, like, everything that's cool. It was poochy. Yes, it was. Uh, it was, like, let's what what do kids like? And let's do all of that, put that into the this new Goblin and uh, have them fight early on and have it not really matter and then have this like like uh, the amnesia subplot which which does prove to be very goblin like the like split personalities and not knowing your actions was was a very much a part of the original green goblin and yes has always been a thing kind of associated with them but like the, the where it was like a bonk in the head was like ah come on we we're better than that agreed <laughs> And you could do more interesting things. Like we did that now twice. Like if it if like Otto Octavius hadn't been a person possessed by his own mechanical arms, mm-hmm. uh, and it had been just more like these are my actions, then then sure you could have done the amnesia thing. But in this case, all three movies have that same plot. Yeah, pretty much. And, and it, it's frustrating. And this is the worst version of it. It's not not like I just got superpowers and it's a crazy person unleashed in me. And it's not I've got the the, the robot. It's I got a bonk on the head. Yeah. But not. Yeah. Yeah. And also in that idea of like the dark parallels of Spider-Man 1 and Spider-Man 3. I know they started to have Willem Dafoe as a voice in Harry's head. And they only they did. They filmed far more than they did. And they had the weird confusing thing with was the butler a thing in Harry's head or not, or was meant to be, but having almost, not Harry's dark personality, but his dark, twisted version of his father uh, yelling at him is its own fun thing. Right, and, and they were doing that in the one before, and I liked that character bit with him. Like, that worked. Yeah, it's it's, it's good fun. Um, it, it's it's good comic book movie. It's, it's that, you know, like we were saying before, you find those rules um, so you can break them beautifully. Yeah. And his goblin was just so over the top. It was it was great, and Harry's never was. No, nope. it was just James Franco. Which, nothing against. Honestly, uh, the whole amnesia thing allowed for some really fun moments and some good uh, bits of character interaction. But at what cost? Right, like it. It was nice moments, but maybe it, if it was a person who couldn't couldn't talk to Peter like they they hated each other so much but at the same time he actually wanted to redeem himself with like MJ yeah which he kind of turns into at a certain point but like if it was a person who was like understands how much he like hatred has consumed him uh but can't stop it yeah uh like it's slowly destroying him but he does want the rest of his life to know that at least he's sorry that it is yeah it, it becomes pathological and not comic book crazy right and uh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah. So let's let, let's talk, I guess, uh, the Venom stuff. So I just pitched a way that like him being introduced becomes more important. And I, I would do the black suit earlier. Like, I mean, I get the idea you want to like set Spider-Man where he is as a baseline, then do the twist with the black suit and then go on. But we've had two movies. Like if the black suit kicks in super fast. And by the way, I would definitely have the black suit look more like the like the OG black suit because I love that giant Spider-Man design. Absolutely. I mean, like I I don't need it to always be faithful, but like there there's no reason it had to be just like a black version of his existing suit. Like it could have been 
uh, I'm hesitant to say like the Batman Forever or Batman and Robin style suit. Uh, Fair. But the Batman and Robin suit kind of could work as long as you don't do the bat nipples. Like you're doing a pretty good like shaped plastic look, which would be very interesting for the symbiote because it would look different than the, uh, the the base costume. Just like just to be like a, a truly alien thing going on with him. Yeah, so it doesn't even look like fabric anymore. Right. Like it's it's it, merged with his flesh and it's just like the spider being pronounced up, upon his form. Yeah, pretty much. It's it's an adaptation upon the mind of Peter. Yeah, so of. like yeah, like that would have been interesting um and have that around for the movie as a whole. Uh because you would still have him eventually give it up and like return to his classic suit. So that would be kind of like in Winter Soldier, Cap rocking like the old, like, or rather the like the spy suit look for the first half of the movie. But then once he's like redeemed himself and he's like ready to like take on the like the sins or, or rather like the enemies by collusion, I should say. Um, yeah. Like have Spider Man in the same way put on his classic suit at that point. And that's when we know that he's back to being a hero. Yeah, and it's just as much, I feel they were a bit heavy-handed at the beginning of, like, everybody loves Spider-Man. Um, and, I mean, you could have that, you could have it muted, whatever. And if you introduce the black suit earlier, it gives a really nice, um, obvious thing for J.J. to point at, to, like, think Spider-Man's up to something. Right. Or, like, find out what's up with us or what's going on. But he's still doing these heroic acts, it seems. And yet... But maybe so a few more it, arms get broken and like maybe it's a little bit more violent. Like maybe it's just enough to start start making people, people wonder. wondering. Yeah. Yeah. And this helps if it's a world where there's a lot of like maybe not full on supervillains, but like more powerful crime. And this also ties in nicely to that idea of growing up past your previous trauma. Because, you know, you think you've put on a good brave face and Peter is somebody who swallows his anger. He's very quiet. He's very reserved. Even in the comics, he's, you know, as much as he quips, that's his way of, you know, venting it out. And when he's truly angry, it's a terrifying thing. Right. And this being a situation where it's like, okay, I think I've grown up. I think I've matured, but man, do I get mad really quick? What's up with that? You know, either continuing a poor cycle, that being something that scares MJ. Yeah. Like, that's what reminds her of her own childhood. And did, th there's far more connection and pivot points here. Yeah. Did, did you ever read the run um, in the 90s from when Chameleon, like, uh, created replicants of his parents to the introduction of, like, the clone saga? Uh, uh, bits and pieces. It's been a while. So there, there was like this theme that like Spider-Man was like so broken. Basically, they were trying to turn him into Batman. Uh, yeah. And he would just like he just referred to himself as the spider in his head. And he was like out at, like night after night getting like more and more beaten. Like he would like never stop being Spider-Man. And like MJ would mm -hmm. barely see him. And he was like just barely turning in work. And he was like this just depressive funk where he was like just being Spider-Man. And he fought like Typhoid Mary. And there was uh, like Scorpion, like all these like uh, encounters with you know, aggressive villains who like hurt him in ways. Like he, he was like cut up. His suit was like, tor like totally torn. Um, and he was like, it was like patched together with webs. His first act nightfall. Yeah. Yeah, basically. And it was kind of also like later when they did it with Wolverine where he would like went monstrous. Uh, yeah, and he was he like wearing feral, a bandana yeah. and like all that. Like, uh, so it was, it was that era for Spider-Man. Um, and like the one of the themes was that Mary Jane was getting really upset and like starting to worry about him in, in that state. That would be the perfect mindset for what you're saying. Like where if Spider-Man started to be that way and like, sure, let's have the black suit be the trigger. Um, but if Spider-Man yeah. started to be that way, that would trigger Mary Jane having fl like memories of her father. And uh, her to become more closed off. And right. Peter feeling like. Either being angry at her reaction as well as worrying that he's hurting her and him becoming more closed off. Yeah, like she basically – like their their relationship is basically through at least the, the status quo form of it uh, before he gets into like emo, like black suit mode in the, what we got. Uh, right. And it's only – he's really only like salting the wound. He's not actually like you know ending the relationship. It's already basically over at that point. So it's – he fucked up yeah. before he even got to there. Um in this scenario, we allow for it to be this terrible influence over him. And you can use it as like a drug metaphor uh, 
or like a drinking metaphor, for example, and that could be the thing yeah. to tie it to MJ's father. True. Yeah, I like this. Sandman. Yeah. Sandman should be more of a force of nature than what he is in this movie. Like, I love his creation. I love all the things that are going on. But I almost feel like Sp- Sandman should be just a thing that's moving through that Spider-Man ha- is trying to mitigate, but he just he just can't stop. It's just a wave. Um, yeah. And so that when he shows up at the end, he should have been like a thing where it's just like Spider-Man was trying, but he just can't succeed because he's not. It, Sandman's just like, no, you don't understand. I need this money. Like there's, it's for my daughter. I need this money. You're not going to stop me. And just like Spider-Man can't yeah. do anything about it. Like we don't need to tie it up with the the plot line of him being like the true murderer of Ben Parker. Right. Um, and if you go with that sort of approach, if Spider-Man finally like is confronted with him, like maybe he finally did something that like actually angered Sandman. Like Sandman should be like almost emotionless about it. It's just like, no, no. Because <laughs> like I, I love the Flint Marco of the comics where he's actually like, he even actually becomes eventually like a hero for a period of time before stupid stories by John Byrne like reset right. his brain. Um, and I like that idea where it's like it, it was always about him like getting to the goal that he had. And it did, it wasn't like trying to be evil. He was just like, I need the money for this thing. And like, I'm not very smart. He was more of a flash rogue. Yeah. He was a crook with superpowers, not a megalomaniac. Yeah. Like he was an Avenger at one point. Oh, yeah. He can do some real damage. He's a serious threat. Yeah. And like, if you I, wanted to make him uh, even a dispassionate antagonist throughout, but just like one of those, one that got away consistently throughout, like, Peter, you need to let it go. Like, I'm almost mad we don't have a superhero actively who's like that. Like, not like part of a team and not a reformed villain, but like. It is I, Defender of the Jersey Shore. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Flint Marco, Defender of Jersey. Hey, you know, in the summer, you get down to Asbury Park, you go to Seaside, some, some crazy stuff goes down. You need a defender like that. And you're right. It is very unfortunate that at the end of it, you look and you go, Bef- in a pre-production sense, Sandman feels superfluous. When you look at the finished product, what they made of him was pretty damn good. It almost feels yeah. like a shame yeah. to take it out, but stuff gets cut. Well, this is why I'm saying, it. like, have him be a force of nature so that Peter's arc isn't about him. He's just a thing that's out there. Like, right. Occasionally robbing a bank and Peter's like, I got to stop you, but I can't. And can't, he like he never gets a, a break to figure it out um, yeah. until finally, like, he does something that angers Sandman. And so Sandman shows up with this confront or at the same confrontation that now Venom and Hobgoblin is Are at. Product. But like yeah. the the like the venom thing was an actual effort by Hobgoblin and like Harry is just Hobgoblin and Hobgoblin you could be he could have re- like actually forgiven Peter like that could have actually happened at that point still so like we're just talking about even just like refining it so that Harry set all these things in motion and he realizes the consequences are going to kill his friend yeah and at that confrontation even turns and so now it's them versus Venom and then all of a sudden Sandman shows up right. It's like, and then there's this asshole. Yeah, and it, or it could be Harry in that scenario. It's like, Osborne, look yeah. at, like, you gave me that money so I could be with my daughter, but they took her away still, or, you know, whatever. Whatever thing. Yeah. You know, he doesn't necessarily have to get his powers from Oscorp, but it could be something that Harry did that, yeah, that, you know, cheesed them off one too many times or just went Yeah, went I'm, not, I'm not saying have him be, like, an experiment that, like Osborne created, especially not if Osborne's also doing Venom, but if right. he's one that, you know, plays him like, he, like less so than like Electro in Amazing Spider-Man 2, but like where he's like, I have the money for you to go do this thing. Like I, I, I can set up a situation where Spider-Man's going to be there. Uh, yeah. And that's when like Venom comes into play. So it's like, or like maybe like Sandman like shows up, like fight Spider-Man like wins, gets some money, but he finds out that his like ex-wife has like taken the daughter away completely, so he will never be united with her, like that kind of thing. Right. Um, exactly. And that's when he's like cheesed. He goes back, finds out that Spider-Man's still alive. That Hobgoblin is like now been like, whoops, I overdid it. I'm teaming up now. And uh, Venom is actually trying to kill Spider-Man. Yeah. Like that. That's a good climax that brings everybody together, and you don't need a moment of yeah. Venom being like. Hey, you want to go kill Spider-Man? Yeah, so this is really a refinement of the movie that we got because, like, we could do more villains. We could do less villains. But I'm – like, this is a pretty good take on the movie we had 
and how you could just make it a little more compelling. Yeah. I'm actually kind of impressed at how like close it is because it, like I was worried that we'd start talking about it being like, well, the only way we can make it is if we cut Sandman. But I think we have a right. way of having Sandman be compelling. We just don't focus on him as much. He's not like the pathos of Peter. He's he's the the, the shit happens of Peter. Yeah. And like, meanwhile, it's like Hobgoblin and Venom that are the pathos. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about Eddie, I guess. Um, yeah. So I like the Topher Grace as a, like an evil Peter Parker kind of thing. Yeah. But like that kind of a character, like where it's just like same, like young man, kind of co- like kind of scrawny, entitled geek, as you said. Um, I thought that was all fine. I think the Gwen Stacy stuff I would have cut completely. So I would have probably had him be more aggressive in his career. If you're going to do a yes. love interest, I, I agree. Betty Brant is the way to go. Like, I love Elizabeth Banks. She's been in two movies. It could be like one of those moments where like she, they set her up as like an older woman. It could have been like Peter's like getting like breaking up with his fiance and like all of a sudden there's like a moment where like she like her hand touches his hand while he's like upset at work and like that's where yeah. like, the relationship starts because that's already there like they don't have to introduce they, a new thing like, yeah being a lab partner like it's a co they established yeah they established the difference in um betty's manner towards brock and parker like within moments of each other like within this film alone without even knowing uh what was built up as a professional or working relationship between Betty and Peter in the first two films. Yeah. It's there. And, and I think because I, I feel, um, in what I've read about people's take on, on Spider-Man three on venom, um, everyone's like, okay, yeah, I can see Topher Gracie. He's not a bad Eddie Brock. He's a terrible venom. And I think some of that is not his fault. Like they don't give us that much venom. Like if, if it's going to be the symbiote, like set him up early enough that you can spend some time in, in costume and see how it's affecting his life. But then have the, the symbiote also be scary. Like not just like shows up once to fight him. And there's a fun comic book style thing you can have running with this. If Eddie becomes Venom sooner and in the sense where. <clears throat> oh, like the stealth killer trying to like kill Peter like outside, like without revealing himself. Yeah. Or like moments that ran of- for like a couple issues before. Yeah, or like Eddie antagonizing Peter or Spider-Man and starting to actually do the symbiote we. And this is both its own thing about him working with Harry as well as the whole symbiote thing. And you get some things of him being a bit sinister without it having to be crawling on the wall with the, you know, his face being revealed. And because the one of the iconic pieces of design of Venom is his face. And in the sound design, when they have him do like screeches and roars, they clearly are fine with doing post-production on the sound. But it's basically the difference between Topher Grace as Eddie Brock and his Venom is all with him. It's like talking like this and then suddenly talking like this. They don't do anything to it. And it feels like one of those characters. If they can do, I know it's 20th Century Fox and, and uh, Sony, but whatever. If they can put vocal effects on Mystique as just a blue person... They can put some, you know, some reverb or something yeah, or just make extra it... voices like Voice of the Legion style mm-hmm. on Venom. And that would have with no changes to, to delivery or character. Um, I think that would have put forth more the Venom people expected. Yeah, you and... can stunt cast it with someone like have the, the other voice, like a voice with like maybe speaking to Eddie in his head. It could it could be anyone like you. It's your chance to have like a second Willem Dafoe pronounced there although maybe that's too cartoony it's it's possible i think you would need to have him as a primary voice but almost like undertones of something yeah or just simply a matter of it being one of those where they you know they run it through every you know the whatever thing and it becomes a big uh monstrous feral sound they didn't really do much with peter talking wearing the suit so no. there's really no development there maybe if there was a if we're if we're going the route that we're talking and they don't do a full on voice over voice, but have him sound bigger, have him sound more mm-hmm. vicious, have him just, you know, in his own delivery and they just make it, they punch it a little bigger. And then when Eddie gets it, it becomes even more like these are those things. Yeah. And, and or just alien screams in the background, like very muted, but like you're, you're hearing like a distant, sc- like alien, like kind of roar uh, every time yeah, he talks. And it's, it's because it doesn't speak English, but it does have a, a voice that speaks out in unison with Eddie's. 
it speaks with him exactly yeah it would it would create that good terror like that's that visceral alien style terror and then you can have eddie just being eddie being like hey p and just a real antagonist yeah. as like, this creepy thing consider this thing so they they play out much more him being like the, the rival photographer because like they make him anti peter um mm-hmm. Uh, imagine like the kind of like rear window esque kind of like stalker shit that you could do, or like voyeur shit that you could do with um, with Eddie Brock n- becoming aware of who Peter is by way of the symbiote. Like he's like studying Peter from afar with like his camera, and then mm-hmm. like he like just like leaps off a building, and then like yeah. or and like he shows up in the moments and like like is like studying Peter using technology but also then like his new like spider powers kind of like again like an anti spider-man like the like the reverse of what peter would do to his rivals yeah very much so and you could have him even as a uh rather than like a kicked out of every other publication now working for the the bugle you could have him as a gossip photographer or something following mj and then discovering peter both through the symbiote and just happenstance yeah and that would give him a reason to have like a rival with Peter from the get-go, like for Peter to dislike him uh, and like to threaten MJ in that regard because like yeah. the, the, instead they go with him being the one to be dating Gwen Stacy who is a rival for Peter's affection herself, but Eddie is not a, like a rival for MJ's affection. Uh, right, and so it, this just, it's a shame to cut that because, you know, his opening line to Captain Stacy was beautiful. The, the whole bit where he comes in and just like, oh, no, no, right, she said yeah. going to be doing a modeling thing. And, oh, by the way, yes, I work for the Daily Bugle. By the way, I'm dating your daughter. <laughs> uh, yeah, it worked fine. It was like a little bit like, okay, here, so here's the guy. This is who Eddie is. Okay, cool. Here's all like the full presentation. Uh, and actually even keeping that presentation for somebody who do, who works for like gossip rags or or is the photographer or works with the publication that, you know, well, maybe the gossip bad rags review of MJ. overlap Spider-Man. Like Spider-Man could be seen as like a celebrity in that regard. Like also true. Like, so maybe it's not for the bugle. Maybe he's trying to get to the bugle because he'd make more money. Uh, yeah. But has been doing like fashion magazines. But they're also like, like, look at who's sleeping with whom. And also see Spider-Man at this thing. Isn't it crazy? There's a Spider-Man. Yeah. And he has to kind of fudge the results in order to get what he needs there. He's, you know. He's he's willing to to cut those corners to get what he wants. And that bites him in the ass. Wow. All right. So I'm really liking this idea for Eddie. I'm liking basically we're just cutting out Gwen Stacy because I think she's superfluous. Uh, And then maybe kind of shifting the the argument of like the. The MJ, like breaking up with Peter to like have a little bit of it be due to the, the symbiote and make the symbiote not not a creation of Osborne, but unleashed by Osborne. Uh, you get to tie in like John Jameson uh, and have the Sandman not be some like the actual killer of uh, Ben Parker, but have him be like a force of nature trying to do his actual objectives. But we don't have like that personal connection with Spider-Man. And as a result, he's a little more distant. Like you still get all these good scenes with uh, Thomas Hayden Church, but it's uh, mm-hmm. it's not one where Spider-Man actually feels like he has power of action. Um, yeah. It's also you get that wonder. You can get that beautiful moment of like, well, how's this guy connected to you? Not everything's about Peter Parker. Exactly. So it actually separates him a little bit more than than what he'd be going for. So we're we're making one a little bit of a, a creation of the other, but we're we're separating the uh, the background connection for another one. So it's not everything that comes through uh, Peter Parker and for, for Richard Parker, like in the amazing movies. Yeah. Well, because as well, um, in in this movie, there's a lot of like, I, I see where you're going, Peter, but you're also now making it about you. Could you stop yeah. that? Like, and having a true blue, like, this has nothing to do with you, um, is kind of nice. It's refreshing. Yeah. So, yeah. Cool. I'm really like this. I was I was afraid we'd get into either being too close to my pitch for Amazing 2 or uh, be in danger of trying to figure out who to crop and not be able to decide. So I'm impressed that we actually made the a tighter version of what we actually got. Uh, yeah, because I, like no matter what, something or someone had to get had to get dropped. There was just too much. But, well, that but now we're just, just doing enough. distance. Like we're not even like dropping. We're we're just creating a little bit more space to breathe. I guess we're dropping Gwen Stacy. Yes, we, we are. We are dropping that, and we're dropping the connections to Flint Marco so that we can strengthen the bonds yeah. elsewhere. So he's being pushed back. Gwen Stacy totally dropped. We can just like we can even like keep the arc, but have it be Betty Brant, uh, and maybe yeah. not, not have the earlier setup stuff. Like maybe MJ's just jealous when it, she like stops by to see Peter at work. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be anything serious. Yeah. It just needs to be implied. Yeah, and like 
because like if we're bringing back John Jameson, then it gives reason for J. Jonah Jameson to dislike Mary Jane and be really mad that Peter's dating her. Yes. Because remember, he paid for that wedding. Oh, yes. So even the caviar. Yep. So that's a, actually perfect if he's like he likes Peter. We know he likes Peter, but he actually is like really pissed off with them because he Peter is the reason why he, had, he spent all this money for a wedding that didn't happen. Yep. Uh, that would have been so much fun. Like he could have yeah, even been like happier with Spider-Man at that point. Like the balance could have shifted. Yeah. Oh, God, that would have been great. So you, you open with that. Been hilarious. Uh, you have Osborne related like plans that lead to him having an opportunity to uh, infect Peter with the Venom symbiote. Uh, mm -hmm. And like he could be a special request from Harry. He doesn't want to do it. But Jameson's so mad at him. So he feels like he has to. Otherwise, he loses his job. Right. So he goes to this event, like this this press event, and it's like just so just when the bugle, um, and it's a great opportunity. But he's infected with the Venom symbiote, uh, and is as a result like then starts to become angry and like aggressive, uh, and that scares uh, Mary Jane, and that starts to drive a wedge between them. Sandman shows up, and like he gets so angry about it, but the guy isn't actually like he's not really hurting that many people. He's just stealing shit. Yeah. Like he's he's not even like really like killing anyone or anything like that. He's defending himself. So like Peter's getting so angry about this guy. Yeah. But it's like, Mary Jane's like, why are you getting so angry about this guy? It's like, because I'm Spider-Man. It's my job. Yeah. Uh, so you go with like that kind of angle. That leads the Sandman to be a, a stressor on Peter's life, but not the thing that's like directly like driving him as such. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that he's so angry is like the indicator that he is uh, focusing too much on his like career as Spider-Man. Uh, meanwhile, Harry is manipulating all this stuff and he's like actually trying to set up the stakes a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, and he is maybe forcing himself into public situations with Peter, but can't talk to him, uh, but is like happy to see Mary Jane. And it creates this like weird scenario where like MJ knows that she shouldn't trust Harry that much, but like Peter can't talk about his relationship with Harry to her. It's, it's like one of those like weird things. Like she knows he's Spider-Man. So she probably knows who the green goblin was, but, Peter can't say anything bad about Harry because of their history and his own guilt. So like she doesn't realize how connected he is. And and it might it might be okay, but he doesn't feel it will be, so he doesn't. Right. So he doesn't or she he doesn't reveal how how connected Harry is to everything and like all the problems in his life. So MJ doesn't realize it. And so MJ feels like she can go to Harry because he's a trustworthy figure yeah. and he's using this and he's using all these other things to like position himself in a better spot against Spider-Man until he actually like finally does like when he like, like Venom comes to me, he's like, Vi like Venom is great. This is great. I have an anti Spider-Man to kill actual Spider-Man with. I'm going to use him. And then when Venom's like in position to do so, that's when he realizes it's his friend and that his father's death isn't really on Peter. It's It was on his father and that he's letting the same thing consume him just the way like the symbiote is consuming everything around him. Yeah. And that's when the Sandman shows up. And then it's a, and then it's a throwdown. Yeah. And then you get Harry to die. But the, it's a Harry who wasn't absolved by being amnesiac, like who was absolved by actually like going through an emotional journey and coming out of it uh, a better man as a result. No one gets off easy on this. Because it's all, you, I mean, yes, you've got the symbiote affecting emotions and whatnot, but those were all things that were still there. Yep. There's no convenient amnesia. There's no reset button. There's no anything. No one gets off easy. You yeah. have to go through it. And we give James Franco a valiant death sequence. Here, here. And Let him die in a nice suit. Yeah. I, I think we have something right there. I agree. And and again, it makes a nice, you know, it's that whole like trilogy feel of like the first one establishes, the second shakes it up, and the third's that kind of like, it, it feels actually a little bit like a, uh, a Dark Knight trilogy where Dark Knight Rises has a lot more to do with Batman Begins. Yeah, well, that's, is, that's third movie syndrome. Um, it's, it, it is third movie syndrome, I know, and that's the first one I think of, but... Yeah, it, it'd I mean, be a good use of it. Yeah, like third movie syndrome has that whole thing. It's it's the reason why, like, Return of the Jedi has a Death Star just like the the first Star Wars, or why Alien Three is like them alone without like undergunned against a single alien, just like Alien One. Um, it's why Last Crusade is Nazis. Exactly. With like a holy artifact like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's why like I don't know. 
Highlander 3, The Final Dimension, uh, has a very similar structure, unlike uh, other movies in the franchise. Truth. Yep. Yep. Just like Highlander 3. Just like it. I'm feeling good about this. Like, it, w- it would be the dark mirror of the first movie because we're talking about having, like, a similar scene to, like, him becoming Spider-Man in the first place. Uh, we get to have some pathos there. But we get to end with your ending of, like, they've they've mended their relationship. He's no longer growing up. He's grown up. And he, like, comes home to his, like, to his woman regardless. To his girlfriend. Of, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, if it's girlfriend or wife or whatever. But, like, it's him and they're, like, a, a, an adult couple. And they, uh, like, understand that, like, neither of them are perfect, but they're trying their best and that they love each other truly. And that's that is the thing that's bringing them together. It's not just like, uh, like, I happen to be attracted to you or you happen to save my life. Like, it's a a true working relationship where they, like, have to be a team together on all of this. And also one last thing I want to point out or or, or bring up um, that final confrontation could be something that Harry calls for Peter. It's like, hey. I want to I, I want to make amends. I want to finally bury the hatchet and it becomes a big thing cuz then you don't have to put MJ in danger. She doesn't have to be a damsel in distress again, which was actually a stipulation of Kirsten Dunst's in the production. She didn't want that and it was a right. last minute nothing could work that they put her in that taxi. So Yeah. It's it's doing well by productions and yeah, I, I mean, I she, know should, we're wrapping she should be up, the one I would to feel like, a miss yeah, not to well, say that. She should be the one to like come in and actually like have a solution. True. Yeah, I think we've got I think we've got a good format here. I mean, hopefully we're not going to see the movies quite like this again or like the amazing movies again. Like hopefully Homecoming, which is coming out next week, is going to be just like a great movie uh, and, you know, like much more in line with like modern like Marvel styles. But I mean, Tom Holland in Civil War was already more Spider-Man than I've seen anywhere else. So, yeah, I'm excited. All right, man. I can't thank you enough for for being here again today. Uh, I know this was kind of well, last minute, right. and it broke a, a pride point that you had for a while. It's it's fine. I guess now I'll finally have to watch the amazing movies. Yeah. Never watched those either. Then I listen, kind of then listen had to a the break. podcast that we did earlier. We have some good stuff because it's good. there's some trouble with them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, thank thank you so much for being here, folks. Thanks for tuning in. I uh, hope everyone enjoys Spider-Man Homecoming. I hope we enjoy Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about Highlander 2, The Quickening. Uh, and until then, stay scruffy, my nerf herders. Thanks for listening to Certain Point of View's Another Pass podcast. Don't miss an episode. Just subscribe and review the show on iTunes. Just go to certainpov.com. watching your beloved characters being tortured by careless authors? Are you sick of feeling like they could have swapped out all of the painful action and the plot would remain untouched? Subscribe to Books That Burn, the fortnightly book review podcast focusing on fictional depictions of trauma. We assume that the characters' reactions are reasonable and focus on how badly or well they were served by their authors. Join us for our minor character spotlights, main character discussions, and favorite non-traumatic things in the dark books we love. Find us on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. Well, that was a picture of Spider-Man. Ah, and we're back. <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, the, the the real star of this movie, or any of the Spider-Man movies, anytime he's J. Jameson, honestly, he's amazing. So, the best casting ever. Yeah, I mean, J.K. Simmons is such a, a fantastic cast choice for, for J. Jonah Jameson that they brought him back for the MCU which yeah. is great. I love yeah, it. Absolutely. 100% approve of that decision. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting looking at this the same way it was for the amazing where now that Spider-Man no way home has come out, there is a reckoning with a lot of the stuff that was done in, in these movies, like the, the missteps of the, the various uh, pre like pre MCU Spider-Man movies have been addressed and in some cases redeemed. Um, although this one, I don't think really it is really touched on as much in no way home because <laughs> 
No. Sandman is is fine in No Way Home, but I actually think they don't do enough with him in that movie versus in this. I love Sandman. Uh, I, I, we talk about this in the episode. The sequence of Sandman coming back from being atomized, like when he first like reforms as sand, is one of yeah. my favorite sequences in superhero movies, period. And it still very much holds up. You know, like I, I will say that, you know, for the most part, this movie still looks very good, you know, and it's 2007. So it's been years. Um, it still looks really good. And Sandman is... I, I I feel like out of ev- all the villains, there are too many villains in this movie. Um, he feels the most compelling and sympathetic. And so it's very easy to like him and, and the effects look good. And it's just, I, honestly, it's one of those things where I feel like one of the biggest missteps of this film is not having more of that character in it. Yeah. This, this movie, it, there's too much going on in this movie. One thousand percent. What you talk about in there, and like the fact that it's studio mandate for Venom, that's the that's the big problem. But the the thing is, per the the general ethos of the show, we try to deal with studio mandates, not say, well, what if it didn't happen? So that that's the the challenge of discussing this movie. Yeah, I, I'm going to say that I actually really enjoyed. Uh, or really agreed with you and Jeff when you said that like Gwen Stacy was like unnecessary in this film. Um, she doesn't like she has one real major point like like or purpose in this film, and that's just to make multiple people jealous. Um, she there's there's no other reason for her to be. She's kind of like a a stand in, and I did not even remember that Elizabeth Banks was in it. And I love the fact that you said, if we really need some lady to make people just, I was like, yes, more Elizabeth Banks. Why yeah. not? She's amazing. Um, and also just makes sense because she's already there at work. Like I know Peter's still going to school, but we're not really seeing a lot of that because there's so much going on. And honestly, like even when I saw this in the theaters, I remember just thinking that like the, the love drama, the, the breaking up to make up and you know all that stuff it was just so it takes so long it it's just consumes so much of this film i mean like i looked because of course i'm streaming this this time and i looked and it's like oh the last time i saw like you know sandman was like um, like an hour 50 or you know like like or 50 minutes in and then it takes like 30 to 40 more minutes before he's back on screen yeah and the same thing with venom it's like a little bit like like eddie brock it's a little bit before that and it's just like it takes so long for this drama that's happening between mary jane and peter and i'm like just break up just stay broken up you guys are horrible for each other this is a horrible relationship <laughs> um and and so there's like it just kind of languishes in the middle of this film. And then you've just got no time to develop anything other with the other villains. And um, I agree with both you and Jeff. I actually do agree that Topher Grace is is great. And what is it? The the nerdy entitlement? Is, is that what Jeff said? Yeah. Like the, uh, um, I, I actually think that it works so well and i and i do agree with you case that it could just be a professional like it doesn't need to be relationship wise it can just be a professional jealousy of like i'm better than him why is he getting better shots things like that and i think that that would have been sufficient enough right just having this guy who's like jealous of like and like kind of like how does this guy keep getting these shots of spider-man i'm a better photographer i have more experience like who is this guy who's just a freaking college student to get better pictures than me and then just like this obsession builds into stalking and you can have you can still have him have like a creepy moment with elizabeth because you know she might as well just be elizabeth holmes but you know what i mean like you can have him like have like that creepy moment you can still have him be a creep. You can still have him be like this guy's like, hey, I'm swarmy and oh, I'm going to mm-hmm. do weird things and just like kind of have him skeeve people out um, and not bring Gwen Stacy into this at all because they literally just use her 
to be saved, to make Eddie jealous and to make MJ jealous. And like every time she shows up, it's just to make people jealous. Yeah, it's it's she, I mean, at least the character Gwen Stacy realizes that she is being used in that way and is offended as such, which is like, oh, well, good on you for acknowledging this whole situation. But yeah, the, the movie itself uses her just as, as a, a totem of uh, yeah of rage and, and envy, uh, which, which is disappointing. And particularly because like the character is so important, but as we point out in this, like in the episode, um, so much of the iconography related to Gwen Stacy had already been usurped by this version of Mary Jane. Yeah. That she wasn't really providing any of that, uh, with, with, you know, that, that like that conflict and that contrast with, with MJ could be really interesting, but they, they didn't really do it here. Um, I, you know, like I, I, I am overall, again, like fairly positive about this movie, but even just thinking about this now, like, man, you know what, you know, what would have been a, a good way to like make the Venom stuff work with both the Goblin and the Sandman stuff? Mm-hmm. Um or at least the Goblin stuff. And at least that way they kind of like connect a bit better. So in the comics, the the deal with Eddie Brock is that he was disgraced because he assumed or he bet on the identity of a supervillain and it was wrong. Like he assumed it was a different person and tried to out them as such. Um, I forget the specifics on the character, um, but that's what, like why he was disgraced. Um, simultaneously, uh, the the villain Hobgoblin has always been mysterious in terms of who is the Hobgoblin. Like that's always been a, a shtick for the character. And so right. infamously, uh, back in the early 80s, I want to say it was when this all went down. Um, maybe it was mid 80s. Um, there was a lot of behind the scenes drama between the writing and the editorial staff. Um, I forget the name he was going by at the time, but he his uh, his pen name now is Christopher Priest was the editor and like kind of fucked over someone who was on the writing team and screwed up what was supposed to be the reveal of who the Hobgoblin was, uh, which was going to be Roderick Kin- uh, Kingsley. Um, and instead went with this like misinformation that he was given that it, that it was Ned Leeds, who is a character who works at the Daily Planet. Um, so in light, light of that, it, I think by this point they'd already reestablished that it was Roderick King, Kingsley because for like 30 years, um, the character, maybe probably not 30, uh, probably more like 20, uh, the character had been Ned Leeds, um, straight through till when, yeah. So I think it was like just before this, that they actually like cleared it up, um, because I think it was like uh, 2004, something like that, when they like finally like got got rid of it all, um, got rid of the Ned Leeds part. Um, and so you could have actually had a scenario where Eddie Brock pinned his assumption of who the this hobgoblin. I'm just going to say hobgoblin because it'd be easy. Uh, was when it in fact it turns out to be Harry. Um, and gets in a lot of trouble as a result of it all. Uh, this could also work where it, he could pin it on Ned Leeds if he wanted to, uh, who could be in working at the Daily Bugle uh, because Ned Leeds was in a relationship with Betty Brandt, who is Elizabeth Banks' character right. um, at the time. So you actually could tie this all together with stuff that was in the comics and give that as a reason for Eddie Brock to have this this hatred professionally for Spider-Man um, and maybe Peter as well, you know. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that that could actually be a really cool kind of element to to tie those two plot threads together. But then, man, Sandman is the reason why they made this movie, but he's the easiest one to cut. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because wait, right, so I know in the episode you um, brought up the the fact that there were plans to make more movies, and kind of the both of you spitballed this like possibility of like instead of having Harry turn directly into Goblin and make that transition in this movie, have him be kind of like a mastermind, like Kingpin, Lex Luthor, X kind of person. And I actually really like that thought. Like, again, I don't know, as you guys didn't know, whether or not James Franco was just like, I'm done with this, you know, because actors get that way. Like, it's been three movies, you know, maybe you want to complete your arc and whatever. Um, But, like... I was thinking about it and I was like, okay, well, if we make him kind of one of those petty villains, right? Because his dad was 
the hobgoblin, right? But he's he's going to take up that mantle. Um, but he can be kind of a little bit different. He can just be, he can kind of want to systematically like take over Peter's life, like take things away from Peter, like play him. And we get a little bit of that playing in the script here where he knows, like he comes to the realization he remembers and he knows and he, and he's kind of doing manipulative bullshit. But what if it's just like what's happening throughout the film? And then you have him hire Sandman because he's so fucking cool. Um, (laughs) And, and in that way, if you want to, and I think that this is a big problem that happened like in the Batman films and even like on some level, even with the Tom Holland Spider-Man, there's something about the studios where like it gets to the next movie and they're like, we have to make it bigger. Let's do 12 villains. And, (laughs) and I think that like they could have balanced that out by if you have, If you have Harry or anyone be like a mastermind kind of manipulator heading towards taking on a mantle, blah, 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 you can have them send out minor villains to like test the water, you know, like Mm -hmm. you you could send out like an electro for like a scene and have Spider-Man beat him very easily or like just any like dime a dozen because spider-man has so many (laughs) but like kind of things and have like a fun montage that doesn't include evil dancing which i don't know why sam Raimi was like the embodiment of evil is a dance number um he's cool um you could still do that kind of thing and kind of make it very funny and kitsch and like have him kind of do that and then kind of discover this very like strong person with a very strong motivation which is his child and you can still have the lovely speech at the end of this film which is i think again this film does itself a disservice by spending so much time on this breakup and this weird symbiote taking over moment that it has that's like basically almost an hour of the film that you miss out on this really lo- like this lovely character that is the Sandman because the acting is really great and he, there is something so beautiful and tragic and he's the wrong guy like he's he's not a good guy but like he's doing the wrong things for a reason that you can empathize with, you know, and, um, I don't know if I would necessarily make him the actual killer, you know, like, I don't know if I'd do that. I I don't know if I would change that about the script, but I do think not having him more in it. And honestly, like it takes too long for the symbiote to reach Eddie. Like it takes so long for him to become Venom. And then because Topher Grace doesn't have a lot of time on screen, we get terrible moments where his face has to show because he needs to be on screen because he needs a certain quota on screen. And it just kind of takes you out of the Venomness. And if we're going to keep Gwen, then, then put her in the car with Mary Jane. Like, have her be there. Have Eddie be like, see, see, look, I'm I'm stronger than Spider-Man. I'm better. Don't you see, Gwen? Mm-hmm. I'm better. Like, I'm better. Because, like, they just kind of, like, get, like, she's just, she's just, yes, she realizes that she's being used, but she's still just an object for everyone in this movie to feel resentment or jealousy against Um and it's, I don't know that that would necessarily change it, but, but there, there was this feeling of obsession and he doesn't quite follow through with it, right? His, he's obsessed with Gwen. That's why he follows Peter to the jazz bar. He's not following Peter. He's following Gwen in the movie. And so the fact that she's not there too kind of feels like a loose end that should have been tied and I'm fine with I know that Mary Jane is the star Kristen Vence is a huge star at this point and I know that but it would have been kind of cool to have them both there and for given a little more power to Mary Jane if she was there holding Gwen's hand being like it's okay we've got this I've done this before It'll <laughs> I've been be through all this right. several times <laughs> I've been through this before I've been in a car I've hung upside down I've it's 
he'll find a way to save us, I promise. I think, ah! you yeah. know, and kind of given a little comedy and levity there too, um, I think would have worked too. Yeah, so, like the, the way that they have treated MJ in the MCU movies with Zendaya, like that level of competency, particularly in uh, No Way Home, um, I think would have gone a long way towards making Mary Jane like more dynamic in this movie. Yeah. Like, I, and again, this is not like everyone in this film acted very well. There's, there's, everyone's having their emotional beats and stuff like that. Um, it's just that she's just still such a victim, you know, like, and, and it's hard because Kristen Dunst didn't even want to be, she, she didn't want to be a damsel in distress. And at the end of the day, she still ended up being just that. And so um, I think like if in that way, if if Gwen had at least been in the car, she'd at least been a person who was like comforting, there would have been a certain amount of like confidence. And it would have, it's a little bit better be, for the overall relationship that I think is not healthy for either of them. But it would have, if she had been there comforting Gwen and being like, listen, it's going to be okay. Like, Spider-Man is really good at this. Because there's, like, a feeling of, like, I'm mad at him and I don't like him very much right now, but I trust him and I believe in him. And, like, that brings you, like, full circle. Also, I just want to say that the scene in the restaurant where he's going to propose um, is, is still funny to me. Um, except for her speech, which I always hated because um, it's so clearly written by a man because she's just like, it was our kiss, not like you fucking kissed her. Like mm -hmm. the point is not that he kissed her in a way that he kissed you. It's the fact that he kissed someone. Spider-Man never has to kiss someone. There's not a prerequisite for saving people. That is not like... That should have been a deal breaker right there. Like, I'm sorry, bro. You cheated no matter what. It's not just that. Like, it could be like you kissed her and it was just like our first kiss. What the fuck is wrong with you? But no, no. The first line should have been like, you fucking kissed her. Yeah, you kissed her. And not only that, you know what it looks like. It looks like the first time we kissed. Like, yeah, you're, you're so, like, deliberately that... trying to like, like, d don't you see how that's like insulting to me? Yeah, so, like, the the whole speech, I was just like, uh, but you're missing the key point. Like, this shouldn't even be a dinner. You should have broken up with him already over the phone. He <laughs> should have been like, no, I'm out. The, that breakup scene should have happened at the, like, like right after the whole parade. Like, there should have been no romance dinner, no, like, Peter's such a dick even before the symbiont gets into him. He doesn't even realize what's happening with her, which, fine, people get busy. But then, like, he kisses someone else, and he assumes that Mary J, like, that she's going to, like, MJ is going to automatically be like, oh, Swoon, I just watched you as Spider-Man make out with someone. Bro, really? Horrible. Mm -hmm. Horrible. Yeah, it, it's so weird, because they, like, alluding to the fact that we, um, uh or that they were planning on making another movie after this one where they were going to do the lizard, which turned into amazing Spider-Man one. Um, like it's, it's so weird looking at this and being like, well, what, what was the plan? Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, if, if studio interference with venom aside um, and, and I get like Raimi not wanting to use venom, venom was relatively new at that point and relatively because like, yeah, he'd been around for 10 years or 15 years in comics, but like Raimi, you know, grew up in, uh, you know, 60s, 70s. And like that was not right. the era of Spider-Man that he grew up with. So Venom was was an insert from studios, but they still had Sandman. And like the end of Spider-Man 2, both MJ and Harry are now aware of Peter's identity as Spider-Man. So like you have to figure out like, well, what is there? Is there another step? Is there another step beyond that? Like what is what's the plan for for Harry if, if it's going to keep going? What's the stuff that's going to be for MJ if it keeps going? Right. You know, instead of just wrapping for, up. Especially with Harry, because, like, I, this is, like, a big, like, pet peeve of mine. And it happens in, like, all the superhero movies, like, just because we want the actor recognition. But, like, people are going out there 
wearing these masks to save their identity. And there's always a time when they're out in public and the mask comes off. And it always kind of like, I understand. I do get it, guys. I understand that like actors get paid a lot of money and stuff like that. But it does somewhere deep down in my brain of practicality, it annoys the crap out of me. And so in this movie, when Harry gets his memories back and, you know, the hobgoblins in his head, the first thing he does is he goes to Mary Jane's house and he attacks her and he is just Harry. He is like full costume on the board, but he's just attacking her. And it's like to manipulate her. And it's just like, bro, like, where are you going? Because now, even if he susses up that outfit, she knows exactly who the criminal is. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, I, like, what else could you do from that? Like, wh- like maybe, I, I don't know, he could blackmail her that if she ever really like reveals him he'll reveal peter like i don't i don't know where where you go from that but like if if you go with the idea which i think and we talked about this i think that the amazing spider-mans were lead were leaning towards that if you go with a harry who wants to be a master manipulator and is okay with keeping the secret as long as he tortures Peter, I think then you've got another movie coming, right? You you yeah. do a Venom, you focus mostly on Venom and Sandman, and you have Harry start using his connection, his wealth, and even his friendship with Peter to kind of, like, start chipping away at the things right and so uh, Brock actually makes a lot of sense because if he's got this professional chip on his shoulder then like Harry supporting him right would help him oh this is uh, like I'm gonna take away your bread and butter Peter like I'm gonna I'm gonna slowly take away everything and so when Peter and MJ break up he moves in, he starts hanging out with her, you know, like he starts talking to her and then there's like this tension because now, now I got your girl. Like, you know, she may not necessarily be with me, but I could pull that trigger, you know? And so it would be like a more interesting, I think psychological, you know, fucking with him. And I think Mm -hmm. that that would be really interesting. And then you can focus on Sandman and you can focus on Brock because they're being manipulated by Harry and they're being fed these things. And Sandman can still be sympathetic. He can still be someone that like, like just touches your heart, which he did. That was such a good performance. Like, honestly, like it's just, and so, um, I, I just think, you know, you skip that and then you can have, Brock defeated, you can have the symbiont uh, kind of unpaired with him, and you can, at your, at your cliffhanger, you can have him then seep into Spider Man, and then the next movie can have a symbiont issue with Spider Man and the Hobgoblin come up and do a fourth movie that's a final matchup between these two friends. Yeah. Um, well, or, you know, or whatever they were, because also, this is. <laughs> Like, what's what, what's the end game with with Harry as a goblin? Uh, but also, uh, they've been teasing Dylan Baker as Kurt Connors for for two movies at this point. Uh, That's who, true. You know, like it, it, he's a pretty big actor to be like just a bit character in these two movies, and it's because they intended to have him play the lizard in the next one. And like, I'm just gonna say this part out here. Dylan Baker went to my high school, uh, Jerson Prep, along with. Like, not at the same time, but with, like, fucktards like Brett Kavanaugh and Neil Gorsuch, but also some interesting ones. Like, like uh, well, also additional fuckers, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., I just realized because I'm, like, looking at the list right now. Uh, so, like, motherfuckers. Um, but then some cool ones like uh, Ian Harding, who's on uh, Pretty Little Liar, uh, Pretty Little Liars. Um mm-hmm. 
uh, Roy Hibbert, who was a professional all-star basketball player. Uh, Arthur Smith, who I actually did shot put with, is the uh, head coach for the Atlanta Falcons. <laughs> so it's just like a weird list of people when I'm looking at this. Mo Rocca, who used to be on The Daily Show. Um, oh, yeah. He's on yeah. CBS This Morning or something like that. One of those morning shows now. Yeah, strange, strange fucking list when I'm looking at that. But yeah, Dylan Baker is the first one on the list of notable alumni. Uh, for some reason, it's, it's there's no order to it. It's not alphabetical and it's not. Oh, actually, no, I take it back. It is alphabetical. There, that's why. But it's, last, it's, but it's last name alphabetical. It's last name alphabetical. Yeah, but because um, <laughs> I was like, wait, why does it go 70s and 40s? And, you know, because I would I would do it um, classier. But <laughs> but but of course, I mean, of course. Yeah. Chris. Uh, yeah, no, you're 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 absolutely right. I mean, honestly, the next movie could be Hobgoblin and Listen, which is kind of like what they did with Amazing Spider-Man. Um, but, you know, again, they added a third villain. We do not need so many villains. I just want to put that out into the world. We just if you could just like all the future writers of superhero and just like in general movies, you do not have to make more than one villain. You can make a villain and make it a really good villain. You can actually develop your villains. You can you can give them purpose. You you don't even have to make them sympathetic. You you but but like you know, maybe just write that character. Just find that out there. I'm looking at you MCU. DCU too. Just, just, just one villain. From here on out, please. Maybe two if it's a good team up. Like, and if it makes sense, like, make it make sense. Don't just throw two people together. Looking at you, Batman Forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, man, Raimi like liked setting up all these, and like you, I, yeah, it's. <sighs> The the ultimate finale we got is at least like, OK, here's a turn for Harry to like redeem himself. That's nice. You know, yeah. Sandman gets to like have like a pretty empath or, you know, empathetic speech. I like I, I also should say I like Sandman a lot as a character. Um, I mm-hmm. really hate that he was turned back into a villain after he had a redemption arc in the comics. And I know why you would do it. I think it was really done the way they did it. Um but it was like actually kind of fun because he had become like a mercenary for a while um, working with Silver Sable. And uh, I, I mentioned this in the episode, like he joined the Avengers for a stretch and actually was typically yeah. a pretty, pretty big defender of Spider-Man. And even before when he was a villain, he was usually represented as someone who's very practical for his his crimes. He was like, I need the money for X thing or I need like I'm just trying to do a thing. I, I really don't want to fight you right now. Like you can also just like leave. and I'm not going to really like be upset. I'm not going to chase you, dude. Just like I, like I'm I'm taking this because I need it. Just. Fuck off, man. And Spider-Man's like, no, I can't do that. And he's like, oh, Jesus Christ. All right, fine. And, you know, that's that's how their encounters typically went. Um, so I like Sandman a lot. I like that they had a really sympathetic version of him here. I'm annoyed that in No Way Home, he kind of like, you know, shifts to being a villain again for a little bit. Um, I don't think there's a real reason for it that's well established in that movie. I think it's implied that he's like having a hard time, like staying together. Um Right. But they don't yeah. really spend much time in uh, like they, they spend the least time on his character, which I get because there's other ones to talk about. Um, so, you know, it's I, I, I like the depiction in this movie. I was really impressed with how comic accurate they got it. I was I thought it was a lot of really cool stuff. They did it. I thought it was a choice to give him flight powers in addition to all of his other abilities as Sandman, uh, where he can just like move around as a cloud of sand because um, that's. That's weird, but I get that it's easier to do that with CG than it is to, like, do what they did in, like, the MCU or in, like, um, in No Way Home where he's, like, actually, like, moving around the the ground um, because that would be – that's a much more complicated CG thing that I don't think they were up to the task at the time. And they did, you know, again, like, the the formation part, so good. Um, So I I like Sandman a lot. I like that we got a redemption arc for Harry – there's a lot of things to like about Brock um, and, and Venom. You know, the the black suit Spider-Man, like making him angry is a newer convention of adaptations that yeah. would have been, I don't know. They, really, what I would have, I, I would have liked if they had held off on Brock. But like the finale as it's written makes sense the way you get to it, because then you get kind of redemptions for two, two thirds. And the, the last third is the one that like is the one that's more of a straightforward villain. Although he, he's actually the hero in the comics nowadays. So, you know, it's a weird, it's a weird fucking world when we're talking about Spider-Man characters. Um, 
I don't know. I like the movie's a mess, but I end up I still like it a lot more than the majority of people. And I yeah, I don't know. I, I, I have a hard time being like, well, change it all these ways because it unravels things that I'd still like about the movie. Yeah, I mean, I I think that, you know, as someone who is not as fond of this movie as you are, I can definitely see redeeming things in this movie. Like I said, actually, all the performances are really good. I think that there are some really, like, beautiful um, acting moments in this. I, th- I think that every scene that the Sandman does is actually pretty good. Um, I think that... Um, Kirsten Dunst gives a great performance. Um, I do hate Tobey Maguire's hair when the symbiont is in him, but I do acknowledge (laughs) that it was in the era of emo and that's what was cool. It looks terrible. It looks terrible on him. Um, But again, he is a good actor and he does do a good job. Um, And I think in general... The script is just a mess and it needs to be streamlined. And I think the easiest ways to do that is to cut out Gwen um, and to get the symbiote faster in into Eddie, which means figure out a different way or more quickly have like the Venom costume or Venom uh, poison Spider-Man and have him more quickly decide like it's not for him, you know, like this is, Mm -hmm. this is not for me. Um, And so, yes, a lot of that stuff in the middle will go, including the snapping of fingers. And listen, I am not a person who hates musical numbers. We have established, I like a good musical number. But it just was so out of left field in this movie. And normally I I am there. I am in it. I am I am in it to when I liked Popeye. Okay. That is a <laughs> weird freaking movie. Um, but I just think that like this is not um it, it just it takes too long. If this was a shorter movie, if it was just about Venom, if there weren't other um villains and moments that we were losing to have that moment um i'd be like fine leave it in it's i don't hate it as much as other people do i know the internet loves to make fun of that moment they love to show uh spider-man snapping down the street and people like following him and stuff like that um but i truly 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 feel like that should go and some of some of the beats uh, between breaking up and getting back together need to shorten for the MJ and Peter storyline. I do think that Harry needs to go to MJ for keeping that with a mask on so that we can possibly do something with his character for a fourth movie. Um, and, and I, and I would just change it. I would only give the Sandman a redemption arc. And I would leave uh, Harry to have his redemption arc in the next movie. Uh, you yeah, know, that's, I, that's kind I, of what I, I'm thinking. Like, if yeah, uh, but uh, honestly, Venom just needed to not be in. Like, they could have done the black suit, but not do Venom in this movie, um, which would be weird. Um, but they could have teased it with him having the nightmares of like the two suits fighting over him that they always like to do. Uh, and then had the Venom show up in the next movie, because then the end boss of this movie, as it were, could have been like Spider-Man, like like Harry teams up with Sandman. Harry is defeated and put sent to jail or something to that effect. Um, and then and Sandman flees. But, you know, we get the, the, the big speech. And then the next movie, uh, it could be like the lizard and Venom kind of coming out or you know come coming to be a thing um and then harry could yeah. have swooped in to save the day at the end that way um I mean, you so we could get that teased, redemption arc you could have even teased a little bit of like the, the like you could have the symbiont still show up right 
um, and have it be the thing that helps him kind of seal the deal at the end, right? And then have him be like, you know, kind of explain to MJ that he doesn't like the way it makes him feel and kind of like get rid of it and then had it like slip into Eddie Brock. So you could still have Eddie Brock in this film and still have him there as like a really annoying person who's like kind of always in Peter's business, which I think actually adds a good tension because one of the things that like the animated series for Spider-Man did so well is always having someone around and Eddie Brock specifically, but even other people that were kind of annoying that they, they just disliked him and they didn't know his secret, but they could have figured it out. Right. And so it's part of that tension of like, why is that guy always around? You know, like, damn it. I'm trying to like save the world. And that guy's right behind me. And like, what did he know? And that paranoia that I think a lot of superheroes get when they start to be observed by people that should just kind of let them pass. Um, and I think that that could have been, you know, like, you know, towards the end of this film, you could have Eddie be like really like suspicious of Spider-Man. And since he's like kind of doing that stalking shit that he's really good at, he can kind of like end up in a position where he's near Spider-Man when he gets rid of whatever it is, like what, however he wants to get rid of the symbiont and he kind of picks it up to figure out what it is and then he's infected. And then that can be your ending leading into the next movie, right? And like, so that like, oh shit, Venom's going to be in the next movie. So you still have Venom. You're still doing what the studio wants you to do. And you still have the moments of Spider-Man having Venom a part of him and maybe even feeling like uncomfortable towards the end, but acknowledging the strength, but then feeling like, no, I need to like defeat people with my own strength and not use this. And then you have Eddie pick it up and then become Venom. And I think that that kind of maybe could have been okayed by the studio because you would still have some of the black spider suit for yeah. the end. And you could have that for the reveal, right? Like Like the final showdown between these characters um you know because you know everyone loves a super saiyan right you gotta power up sometimes when you're going to the ultimate showdown and then you can still like have venom in it and then lead to like venom being an even bigger part in the next movie and kind of making that promise and i think like honestly a lot of people have been like, yo, Venom, oh my God, you know? Yeah, I mean, even picturing it as, like, the, the post-credits. Yeah. Not that that was a big thing for the Spider-Man movies, but post-credits weren't invented by the MCU. Um, and, right. like, can you yeah. imagine, like, you get the church scene, but you don't see Eddie's there, and then, like, you cut to, you cut back to it, and, like, you see, like, the, the you know, the symbiote being ripped off, and then it, like, flows down and then you cut to Eddie like and it starts dri dripping on you can even do the full transformation and that's like just you know fade to black uh right yeah. after that would have been a really cool thing uh for for hinting at like, the next Spider-Man movie and then they would have had to make that Spider-Man movie yeah and it would have been great because then you've got this showdown from this guy who was annoying the whole other movie right <laughs> right yeah. like like just up in his craw except now this guy, this guy has power, you know, and, yeah. and that would have been like this person who already already resented you has power. And I think that that would have been like a nicer, cleaner development for these films. Um, and you could even break you could have Venom break Harry out of prison. You know, if that's how we're ending instead of redemption, we send him to jail Right, we can like have the opening Venom. of the next movie, he could be broken out by, by Harry. Right, we can have by, Venom uh, go to get Eddie. him because he knows he must know something about Spider-Man. And yeah. he wants to know everything. And then that makes them infinitely dangerous. Yeah, I like that. Um, you know, it's it's weird to speculate on like a multi-movie situation like that because then we start getting more variables. But 
Um, it, it certainly yeah. would be fun. Uh, yeah, like, you know, the first two are so good. I think that the, that's the biggest problem when talking about this one, where e- even the most okayest of okay movies is going to be a huge letdown after Spider-Man 2. Yeah. Uh, and this movie's a messy movie. Like, so it's okay, but it's me- like, I, I don't pretend that it's not like a, a, a hot mess in terms of like its structure, like all, all the, you know, all the things that went into making it, but I still just do rather like it. Um, and so it is weird for me to be like, t- go too hard on it because like, again, like it's not one that I, I have an axe to grind for it. Um, and often find myself defending. Um, and it's also not one where it's, you know, a, because it's so complicated how it got fucked up by the studio and by everything and all the plans that they had going into it that like it's a very difficult one to like fully beat out without necessarily uh breaking the whole structure Um, yeah but i i do like that idea and i think um i think it could be done um it would require some faith in the audience in a way that like now we would be fine with like mcu would be totally down for that kind of like you know, pacing out. Oh, of like, for sure. Uh, sequel baiting. Um, I don't know if Sony was into it at that particular time, just because of where the the industry was. Um, but it, I think it would have been well received. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it would have done. I think it would have done well. I mean, this is, you know, um, I people are not as old as us possibly listening to this, but Spider-Man one and Spider-Man two were big hits. They were, you know, they actually, the critics liked them. You know, yeah. it's, I mean, Spider-Man not... one set a new box office record for opening weekends for, for movies. Like it, we, yeah. like when we say like, Oh yeah. Well, like James Franco was becoming a bigger star. This is the movie that made James Franco a star. Like, the yeah. reason why he was the big celebrity of the Freaks and Geeks crew is this like this franchise of movies. Uh, and while Tobey Maguire had been doing a bunch of stuff like he became rich because of these movies. And yeah. Kirsten Dunst had, while well, yeah, tons of movies over the course of her career, like she became like able to do whatever project she chose to do and not having to like do ones for money because of these movies. Like these are, these were some of the biggest movies that ever came out. Uh, and so the fact that the third one was kind of a whimper doesn't, change the fact that they were hugely successful as a result of these movies. Yeah. People had immense expectations going into this particular film. Yeah. That's because because they true. had had so much fun with the other two. Like, so much so that, like, people were totally o- willing to overlook the fact that webs just shoot out of him. <laughs> like, like, the normal criticisms that you get. I mean, not that there were no criticisms, but but like people didn't really harp on it because they enjoyed these films like the first and the second film so much that there's like but there are still people on there are people on the internet that will show pictures of Tobey Maguire and say that's my (laughs) Spider-Man you know like like there's like real feelings those same people also pretend that Spider-Man 3 does do not does not exist but um (laughs) But but I will say that like that is why this movie is such a big letdown, and it's interesting because there are other comic book movies that are worse than this one, but this one gets a lot more shit. Yeah. Than those. Yeah, I mean we're we're recording this call right after I just got off a Men of Steel call talking about Superman four, the quest for peace, mm-hmm. and I would say that both Superman three and four are way worse movies than this one. For sure. For sure. And I absolutely positively agree with that. So I, I will say that as someone who is less positive on this movie than you, I will say that it is better than those two Superman yes, movies. By, by far. Yeah. But like like I said, I, I, I think I spoke most of my piece in the actual episode. I don't really just have yeah. that much to say. Always enjoyable to have a Case and Jeff episode as far as I am concerned. I'm not just saying that because Jeff uh, edits our stuff. Um, I really truly believe that. And um, I love his insight. For sure. Yeah. Jeff, Jeff, I mean, Jeff and I have like such good rapport, like the, it, the show is kind of birthed from the two of us having conversations. So it it's always great having him. And for a long time, he was tied neck and neck with with Ben and Addy for a number of guest appearances um, and might have eclipsed them at this point. But I would have to really stop and figure out who has been on the show the most, uh, not counting the two of us. So that that would right. be an interesting challenge right there. It would um, be. On that note. 
next time on the bonus episodes, we are going to have another Jeff episode <laughs> because, as I mentioned, we're talking about the next planet or not the next. We're talking about Planet of the Apes, the 2000, uh, 2003, I think, uh, Planet of yeah. the Apes movie. Wait, I've got it uh, in my notes. I think it's 2003. Yeah. 2001. 2001. Planet 2001. Of the Apes movie. I and this will be interesting. I will have to rewatch it because I have not seen it since I saw it in the theater. So I'll have to rewatch it because I don't remember a lot of it. And now I've watched so many Planet of the Apes movies that I really need to rewatch it. Right. I, you know, it, by nature of us launching this, the bonus episodes after we finished our like Planet of the Apes marathon, there was no way for us to sync it up so that this happened close to when that one came or to when right. we concluded it. But it's still pretty fresh in our minds. <laughs> It's like, it's like, I'm like, uh, I'm going to remember facts for one of the first five and nothing of this. So I'm going to have to watch it. So that'll be yeah. interesting. Yeah. Uh, so that's going to be a fun one. It's a good episode. Likewise, that was, like I said, uh, recorded because War for the Planet of the Apes had just come out or was coming out. So we uh, we wanted an episode that uh, tied in, you know, because of SEO, all that, all that stuff. We don't really worry about it too much on the show, but like when it can sync up, it's like cool. And especially when it was like new, we were like, oh, yeah, that, that, that'd be fun to like do an episode on, a, on a, a, you know, low hanging fruit uh, for, for some of those. So that was so that's the next bonus episode. Meanwhile, on the main show, uh, we just just as in very big air quotes right now. We just did Power Rangers 2017. And the next episode we've got up is actually Practical Magic. That one we've had in the can for a while because we recorded that before my daughter was born. Uh, and we've actually got the next couple recorded. So that's good. And we'll, you know, we're we're all dealing with some personal stuff. Uh, but particularly for me, like the baby stuff is just makes it really hard to get the episodes like finished and out the door. Like even even with, you know, Jeff doing a great job editing the actual episode, um, there's still work that goes into it beyond that. One of which is like the episode art which you know is like yeah whatever but like i i i, I like having episode art that looks good and yeah. i like doing the the clips that we do and all, all all those things that we work on and also just posting it like takes mental space that is difficult to do when <laughs> uh you're super sleep deprived and uh -huh. barely sitting at your computer ever when when you have a new baby yeah demanding demanding things feed me see more sorry i couldn't help myself apologies <laughs> no it's all good um baby but, chaos is not like that <laughs> but life uh is going to stabilize at some point we're getting you know we're, we're getting our shit together uh and we'll we'll be back with more episodes in a semi-regular rotation until we finally get back on some kind of schedule um and i appreciate everyone for all of that um yeah thank you guys thanks for bearing with us yeah, yeah, but we've we've got some good fans who have, have reached out and have been uh, expressed that they were cool with it. So I I do appreciate all of those, and you know, like like I said, we've got we've got more stuff coming. I'm I'm really excited for all this, and yeah, um, can't wait to to talk to you again for uh, for a real episode. Yeah, that was baby <laughs> brain right there, guys. That's that's what happens. Yeah, this this whole call has been just like, oh man, like, do, do you know how much, do you know how much I haven't slept? Uh, so much, so 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 much, so um, much. So what if he when he slows down? That's what it is. Yeah, <laughs> that's where we're like. <laughs> if you want to see normal case, you have to like crank your your podcast player just like a little bit up, but then also be ready to like throttle it back when I do have those moments of lucidity. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When you get really excited, you're like, well, actually, right. in 1980s in the comics, blah, 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 blah. and I'll just go too fast. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Sam, do you have anything else you want to bring up before we go we call it? No, I think we fixed it. Yes. Fixed. <laughs> Everything's fixed. Done. Rescued. Achieved. Film rescued. <laughs> Passed another. All right. Uh yeah, so like I said, we'll be back next time to talk about Practical Magic, which was a really fun conversation with Anna Grindrod Feeney, who is one of our friends from Certain POV. Check out our website, certainpov.com. You can find tons of great shows over there. You can find a link to our Discord server. Come chat. We're having great conversations yep. there. I actually can like, because I can do it on my phone, I can, I'm can. i actually like somewhat present there as opposed to my anything with a computer because like I'm either at work or I'm dealing with a baby normally uh yeah. and my wife is being very nice by letting me record a bunch of stuff tonight so yeah uh, thank I'll, you yeah <laughs> they're, they're awesome everything's great um and uh yeah uh, and until next time if you enjoyed the show pass, yeah, it, pass on. it on pass it on
Please. Bye. Bye. Pass it on. Stay classy, San Diego. All right, Josue, let's go through our new comic day stack. We have a lot to review. I know. Maybe we've gone too far. Well, let's see. Marvel, of course. DC. I got Image. Dark Horse. Black Mask. Boom. IDW. Aftershock. Vault, of course. Mad Cave. Oni. Valiant. Scout. Magma. Behemoth. Wow, that's a lot. Oh, all we need now is a name for our show. We need a name for a show about reviewing comic books every week. Something clever, but not too clever. Like a pun? It's kind of cheesy. Yeah, it's something that seems funny at first, but we might regret later on as an impulsive decision a few dozen episodes in. Yeah, we'll think of something. Join Keith and Osue for We Have Issues, a weekly show reviewing almost every new comic released each week. Available on Geekly Media and wherever you listen to your podcasts. Cool EO. All right. Um okay. Yeah, shit. I, <laughs> just, uh, this is another pass at another pass. Yep. It's what we're doing today. CPOV. CertainPOV.com.